this particular mini-series, which we'll be starting today, will be on the Antichrist. And there are many voices today. One of the things that, especially with the military background, Paul can probably attest to this as well, knowing your enemy is vital. It's vital. It's important. The Apostle Paul says that we are not ignorant to the wiles of the devil. We are to know the types of deceptions that come out there. There's been talk for centuries about the identity of the Antichrist. And there really are three separate ways to interpret it. And then individuals usually fall in those categories. Some people think it's Trump. People used to say it was Obama. People say, well, it's not a person. It's, it's, it's Islam in general. And we looked at that when we looked at the nation of Israel. Nero in the past, Caesar. Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, the Seleucid king of the remnants of the Grecian Empire in Syria. And some, and I, I have heard before that some believe that Satan will find a way to mix his DNA with human DNA and will create a being which will be the Antichrist. I've heard that one used before. So today, and we're going to pray here in a second, but today we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about the Antichrist. And the reason we want to do that is because we want to know for certain who the Antichrist is. We don't want my interpretation of it. I don't want my interpretation of it because my interpretation might not necessarily be true. We have to come to God not with the idea of reading his word and telling his word what it says, but by reading his word and simply asking to know what God is revealing there. That's what we're going to seek to do today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for your word, that it is a bulwark against the enemy, that it is the sword of the Spirit, Lord, that we can, we can trust in it and we can find the safe paths, the old ways, Lord, that we can find shelter and security spiritually, Lord, in them. Thank you so much for your word, which you have preserved for us through the ages, through the turmoils, through the persecutions, Lord. Help us to be stronger, to be more committed to learning what your will and purposes are for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm calling this, I'm calling this the Antichrist Showdown. And because these, all these different interpretations of it, they're really vying against each other. So what I want to do here, which is different than you may have seen it before, is I'm going to compare them all side by side because I like to see things visually and show which boxes get checked where. And we can see as we go down the list who's checking the boxes and who's not when we see the characteristics. We're going to focus specifically on the Antichrist. And the Antichrist, and I think this is important to remember, the Antichrist power spoken of in the Bible, it only exists because we allowed it to exist. Believers. Do you think the Antichrist would have appeared in the days of the Apostle Paul? I doubt it. I highly doubt it. He talked about wolves coming in after he left. It was the spirit of compromise which Revelation chapter 3 in the letters to the churches talk about allowing the, that the harlot Jezebel to teach 
that spirit of compromise led to the Antichrist power arising. Because the Antichrist power, in a nutshell, is human aspiration fully realized, right? I mean, at the end of the day, when we reject God, we want to be God. That's how that works. We want to be God. So the Antichrist, in the place of Christ, is the full realization of that carnal nature of humanity that we all possess. So we're going to kind of fast forward in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7 where we see this little horn power come up uh, past this. First we see the, the lion come up, which is Babylon, and then the bear, which had the three ribs in its mouth because it destroyed three empires or consumed three empires. The Medo-Persian Empire bear raised up on one side. Greece with the four divisions, the four heads, and the four wings signifying the speed. And then the terrible beast, which was Rome. Now, in, in chapter 8, these two are pointed out by name. In chapter 2, this one's pointed out by name. The word Rome never appears in these chapters in Daniel, okay? How do we know that it's Rome is the terrible beast that comes after Greece? What's that? Ten horns, ten kingdoms, okay, yeah. This power took captivity and control of God's covenant people, okay? This is why this, is, this beast represents Babylon. Now, which was the next kingdom or empire that took over God's people? Persia, right? And they allowed them to go back, didn't they? And rebuild the temple. Then what came? Greece. Greece was in control of Israel. This is why it's not the Incan Empire or any of the Asian dynasties, or the greatest, largest wise empire to ever exist, which was the Mongolian Empire, throughout all Asia, Russia, and over into the northern parts of Eastern Europe. It's not them because Greece took over Israel and gained control of God's covenant people. Who was the next power to do that? Who took out Greece and when Jesus was born, who was in control? Rome. It was Pontius Pilate, right? The provincial governor who had Jesus executed. Again, even after saying that he was an innocent man. So, who was in control of God's people? Rome. That's why it's Rome. That's why it's not the Incan Empire or some other empire. It's the, the countries, the kingdoms that gain control of God's chosen people. Paul? You made a statement earlier about in Paul's day the um, Antichrist had not appeared and could not. It wasn't ready. The spirit was there. Mm -hmm. And the thing about demonic religion is what people don't realize, and that's how these powers came to be, Humanism is the pinnacle, the ultimate satanic worship. For instance, today we have praising children for everything, mm -hmm. don't offend me. All, this is humanism. Self-help books. Pride, self-help books. And in Rome, the more evil you were, the more godlike they made you, mm -hmm. which is amazing, which is exactly how Rome works. But that's humanism. Yes. So the, the stage is set and ripe for the plucking. Right. It's that spirit of indulgence that exists within every human being that seems to get applauded. The spirit of conquer with Alexander and, and Julius Caesar. Those are the spirits that get applauded, that, that get praised, that get deified. Whereas the courage and the strength coming from God and aided by divi divine, let me put it this way, human effort and divine power together in self-control, that's never applauded, is it? It's only the indulgences, the excesses that are. 
So this is, the, as Paul said, humanism is, it is the Antichrist power, humanism. It's just, it, it fills into it. So we have three major views that all the other views fall under, okay? We have preterism, which is the belief that the little horn power spoken of in Daniel chapter 7, which we're going to get into the verses in a minute, that it refers to an individual in the past. Okay, this was fulfilled by Antiochus IV Epiphanes from, from Greece, or Emperor Nero, who, her, who persecuted the Christians, blamed the Christians for the fire in Rome. Then we have futurism, and dispensationalism falls in here as well. You know, they have, this is, this is the most common belief throughout Christianity as a whole today, is futurism. That it's some guy in the future, or some power in the future. They have movies about this, pre-trib, post-trib, no-trib, all that, all that fun stuff that they talk about. Futurism is the belief most commonly held by the world today, and I think you'll find it very interesting as we look through it. And then we have the historicist view, is what it's called, because we like to call things ists and isms. So that's why it gets that name. The historicist view simply means that you're reading the Bible, you're looking at things that have happened in history and seeing how they correlate. And the historicist view always believed that the papacy was the fulfillment of the Antichrist power, the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. This is the historic Protestant view. But remember, the Protestants being part of the Reformation were protesting against Catholicism. So we might not necessarily be able to trust them, right? They're probably biased. <laughs> Martin Luther was not, I'll tell you that. Martin Luther never wanted to leave the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform it. Thus the name, the Reformation. In fact, on a side note, I think you might find it interesting. When Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel, he wrote it in Latin. Did you know that? Latin was not something that was spoken of by anybody but the scholars and the clergy members who had studied it and learned it. So what Luther was actually trying to do when he wrote that was he was trying to uh, start a scholarly debate on the issue of indulgences. That's what he was trying to do. He was not trying to destroy the church. But you see, somebody who could interpret Latin took it, put it in the language of the people, and it spread like wildfire throughout Germany. But it's interesting. If you stand up for the truth, the persecution, the conflict, it will find you. <laughs> you don't have to go looking for it all the time. So let's, let's look at a synopsis on Nero. And I have some of the sources here that I used these are my words, but these are the sources that are, I'm sort of uh, summarizing here. And you can find all this information there. He's the fifth Roman emperor. Okay? He reigned from 54 to 68 AD. His mother, Agrippina the Younger, had cunningly conspired to assassinate Claudius to insert Nero as emperor, to which five years after the start of his reign, he killed his mother. And you can look at that from Emperor Nero, facts and biography from LiveScience.com. He took the throne at age 16, guided much by Seneca in his early years, who later he forced to commit suicide. According to Tacitus, Suetonius, and Cassius Dio, Roman historians, Nero lived an extravagant and cruel reign. He caused the great fire of Rome, according to them so that he could destroy ancient Roman buildings that were in the way of his plans to construct Domus Aria, which was a building construction he had, of which he blamed the Christians, who then, proceeded, who then he proceeded to persecute, outlaw, torture, crucify, use for entertainment in the Colosseum, 
and he even used them as torches for his personal parties at his palace. Pretty sick, right? Tacitus states that he did this out of his own cruel desire and not for justice for the fire of Rome uh, in Annals, book 15. The Apostle Paul was beheaded during his reign, and as was Peter martyred, and the first Jewish war began, which ended with the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD. He fancied himself a god, accepting the titles of Mithra, the new Apollo, and the new sun. Nero accused his political enemies of false treasonous crimes and had them executed, along with some wives who he accused of adultery. In 64 AD, he was married to a freed man, a man by the name of Pythagoras, of which Nero wore the veil as a bride. Eventually, Nero's paranoia and excesses caught up to him when a rival, Galba, declared himself emperor, the Praetorian Guard and main Roman army abandoned him and refused his orders, and the Senate declared him a public enemy, sentencing him to be beaten to death in the Roman Forum for all to see. Before their purposes could be carried out, Nero committed suicide and civil war ensued. From the Encyclopedia Britannica on Nero, and from a book by Edward Champlin, Nero. Simply Nero from 2005. So, Nero was not a good guy. He was not a good guy. He's a very sick guy. And as you see, uh, ascending the throne, I mean, what kind of person do you have to be that would kill their own mother? But then again, his mother got him in office by assassinating others who were in her son's way. <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy. I mean, who would want this life? This was the king of the world at one point. So, definitely not a good person here. Antiochus IV Epiphanes, another synopsis um, from books on Josephus, uh, the, the, the source is at the end, so we'll, I'll show you the source at the end. Again, these are my words, it's a synopsis of many pages, okay? He was a Seleucid king. He reigned from 175 to 164 BC of the remnants of the Greek Eastern Empire, which was one of the four divisions. In Jerusalem, there was a local feud between two parties for the office of high priest, between Jason and Menelaus who the less successful Menelaus appealed to Antiochus, showing a desire to abandon Jewish law and custom and become more Greek, even building a gymnasium in Jerusalem under Antiochus's backing. Now that's really oversimplified about exactly what was going on between those two individuals, but this was the open door that Antiochus for Epiphanes was offered when the Jews asked for his help to settling the dispute of high priest. Okay, so they opened the door to him. Antiochus IV led a successful campaign against Egypt led by the Ptolemy dynasty, which was another Greek division. Shortly after, he was routed when the Roman Empire intervened and sent Antiochus IV back to his realm. Not able to claim any spoils from his advances in Egypt, he sacked Jerusalem upon his return and stole great wealth. And he did that because they were problematic within his empire, or what was left of his empire. And he, he essentially, he was really upset that Rome sent him tail between his legs back to his realm. And he said, you know what, I'm going to deal with these people in Jerusalem now. So that's what he did. He plundered the temple wealth, stole the sacred furniture and veil, ordered the halt of the daily sacrifices, carried away 10,000 men, women, and children captive, and slew many, set up a garrison in Jerusalem, which tortured the citizens, and finally set up an altar to Zeus in the temple and offered swine upon it. He went further to compel the Jewish nation to forsake the worship of God and to pay homage to idols, many altars in his own image, commanding temples and altars to be built throughout the land, where Israel's priests were told to offer swine every day throughout Judah. He outlawed circumcision. He outlawed the Sabbath. And he outlawed the word of God. Those who disobeyed, and this is a quote from Josephus' book, they were whipped with rods, and their bodies were torn to pieces and were crucified while they were still alive and breathed. 
They also strangled those women and their sons whom they had circumcised as the king had appointed, hanging their sons about their necks as they were upon the crosses. That's sick. And if there were any sacred book of the law found, it was destroyed, and those with whom they were found miserably perished also. So in other words, if you were found with the word of God, not only was the book destroyed, but you and your family were destroyed. The Sabbath was outlawed. The whole daily ritual of sacrifice was changed to idol worship for a time under him. The Samaritans, who had claimed to be God's true people in times past, had claimed to be a Sidonian colony cutting all ties with Jehovah. They wrote an epistle to Antiochus for his persecution of all those following Jewish custom. Outlawing the Sabbath also, they, were, they stated, quote, to Antiochus the God, okay, Epiphanes, a memorial from the Sidonians who live at Shechem. Our forefathers, upon certain frequent plagues, and as following a certain ancient superstition, had a custom of observing that day, which by the Jews is called the Sabbath. Now, upon the just treatment of these wicked Jews, those that manage their affairs, supposing that were of kin to them, and practiced as they do, make us liable to the same accusations, although we be originally Sidonians, as is evident from the public records. We therefore beseech thee, our benefactor and savior, capital S, to give order to Apollyanus, the governor of this part of the country, and to Nic Nicanor, the pure procurator of thy affairs, to give us no disturbance, nor to lay to our charge what the Jews are accused for, since we are aliens from their nation and from their customs. But let let our temple, which at the present hath no name at all, be named the temple of Jupiter Hellenius. Antiochus agreed to the, this term and ordered to a cease of all disturbances against Samaria after they dedicated their temple to Jupiter, which is Satan. Uh, and this is all these, these quotes were from Josephus, Antiquity of the Jews, volume 11, uh, chapters 4 and 5 of the works of Josephus. Later, this is, this is a, an artistic rendering of the altar to Zeus set up in the Temple Mount with swine's flesh being offered upon it, and the Greek, Syrian Greek soldiers that were there. Later, Judas Maccabeus led a guerrilla war against Antiochus IV, which was successful returning autonomy, that's independence, in 164 B.C., which they retained until the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Uh, collected from 1st and 2nd Maccabees and the Encyclopedia Britannica on Antiochus IV Epiphany. So Antiochus IV, he was, <laughs> he was no good person either. In fact, Antiochus IV Epiphanes is a Greek word where we get the word epiphany from because he just thought he was so great Okay, And he ruled over the Jews for a time. But eventually, keep this in mind, eventually the Jews rose up against Antiochus. The Jews did. And they defeated him and regained their independence. So now let's get into Daniel on the little horn power. Here we go. Now that we know what's going on with Antiochus, with Nero with Islam, and with the papacy, we'll take a look at who fits the role. Daniel chapter 7, verse 7 through 8, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom, three, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So we've got to sort of unlock some of these symbols. Because we're not actually talking about a, uh, an actual little horn, are we? Right? 
We're talking about beast powers as we discuss our kingdoms. So a little horn, we have to unlock that symbol and find out exactly what it means. So what is a horn? Daniel chapter, same chapter, uh, going a little bit forward to verses 23 to 24. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another, another what? Another king shall arise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. Okay, so what is a horn? It's a king. And what is a beast? A kingdom, right? So if we have ten horns on a beast, we have an empire kingdom that has ten kings that obviously have some type of authority within that kingdom. Then we have a little horn arise. It arises up. It wasn't there in the beginning, but it arises up after, after the division of the ten kings, and then plucks three up by the roots. And the Bible, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but the Bible also says he becomes more stout than his fellows, which means he grows much taller than the rest of them. He becomes the king on this beast. So we know the beast is Rome. Who are these horns? This, is, this was something that was offered by uh, the people that believe that Islam is the Antichrist. Are these possibly the, the ten kings of Daniel chapter 7? Well, first off, do they come from Rome? No. Um, Egypt, Sudan, Libya, all the, they're, they're listing all these different kings here from Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And I, I'm, I'll ask the question, what about Jordan? What about Saudi Arabia, which is by far head and shoulders above all these other nations in power? What about Oman, Yemen, uh, Arab, United Arab Emirates? What about those countries? Do, are those considered part of the horns too? Who decides? So this, this is, to me, this is, this is too confusing. This is sort of shaky ground. I like things that are simple, don't you? Because I have to remind myself when I'm reading the Bible, that this Bible was not written for geniuses only, so that the genius could understand it, the scholars could understand it, and that they could give it to the rest of the people. It was not designed for them only. It still was designed for them. This book, the Bible, was designed so that if the whole world was purged from any remnant of Christianity, that if a, a word of God was dropped in the hands of a peasant in Australia, a cook in Canada, a business person in Asia, that after they accepted the truths that are within this, in that book, that if you brought them all together, their faith would be identical. That's who this book was, was written for. So this, this is confusion. Who decides which, which is the horn, which, are, which horns are in, and which horns are out? Who decides? A human. A human being. On the other hand, this is the Roman Empire. This is the beast in all of its glory, okay? This is 117 AD. This is in the time of Hadrian, who expanded the empire to its greatest limits that the Roman Empire had ever saw and would ever see again. From here, the decline came, and it just continued to decline until it eventually withered away. Officially, the Roman Empire, not talking about the Roman Senate, but the empire under an emperor started in 27 BC through 476 AD. And the reason why it goes, and this is the traditional dates, the reason why it goes to 476 AD is because that's when Rome was taken from the Romanists, okay, and the Germanic tribes gained control over them for about a hundred years almost. So that's when Rome was, that's when the capital was taken. So we see in history that as the decline came, you see it's a much smaller area here, 
Eventually, it split into two separate sides. You had the East and the West Kingdom. What was left of Rome and the Roman Empire, the Western Kingdom, the Germanic tribes began to move in, and they wanted rights. They wanted what Rome had. Everybody wanted a piece of the Roman Empire. So as Rome is declining, due to all the power being in one person and the atrocities that were done by Caesars, Rome began to decline. And as they decline and their power weakened, you had different powers that were jockeying for who was going to be the new leader of Rome. So you had these Germanic tribes, you had the Elamani from Germany, the Franks from France, the Visigoths in Spain, the Suevi in Portugal, the Lombards in Italy, the Burgundians in Switzerland, the Anglo-Saxons in Britain, the Heruli, which were in Italy and parts of Greece, the Ostrogoths, which were in Greece and Macedonia, and the Vandals, which were right here in North Africa. The last three kingdoms, the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, these last three horns, okay, kingdoms, kings, they were destroyed according to history because they would not accept the church's decree on the divinity of Christ. And this is what is known as the Arian heresy. The Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths, all, and there was other parts because this was a belief system that was going on, they believed in Arianism, which is the belief that Jesus was not God. Okay, in a nutshell, there's other aspects to it. But that's what it is basically. So really, on, on the beast, and we're looking at the horns, you have all these Germanic tribes, these ten horns, they're trying to gain control of what's left of Rome. Then you have a spiritual aspect, which is Arianism. Arianism is also trying to take over Rome as a whole. And then you have another spiritual aspect, the Roman Catholic Church, or Romanism, and what was left of the empire that are fighting to keep what they have and destroy Arianism. So you have one that's just a political power in the Germanic kings, you have one that is a spiritual force in Arianism, and you have one that is both in Romanism. That's what you have going on here. History shows that the Heruli king, Odiacer, who took over Rome in 476 AD, remember that's when the Roman Empire is considered to be over, was defeated by the Ostrogoth king Theodoric in 493 AD. And they ruled from that time until... The Roman general, Belisarius, defeated the Vandals as a nation in 534 A.D. And the Ostrogoths in 538 A.D. were eliminated from Rome. So Rome was taken over by the Germanic tribes. It wasn't clear who was the victor at that point of these three jockeying powers. It wasn't clear. Rome, Romanism lost its seat, lost its power when the Heruli and then the, eventually the Ostrogoths who destroyed the Heruli came and took over Rome. Rome regained control of the city of Rome in 538 AD and destroyed the other kingdom. So you had the Heruli horn wiped off the face of the earth, wiped off the beast, okay? That's one horn plucked up. Then the Ostrogoths, or sorry, the, uh, yes, no, the Vandals in 534 were destroyed by General Belisarius. And then again, General Belisarius defeated the Ostrogoths and removed them from the city of Rome. There's your three horns that were plucked up by the roots. And what was the issue? Why were they plucked up by the roots? It was a theological issue. They were destroyed because they would not accept the church's decree on the divinity of Christ. That's why they were destroyed. Now, whether Christ is God or is not God, do I have the right to destroy somebody if they don't believe as I do? No. 
So that's not Christian, is it? Keep that in mind. So the horn, because remember, we're talking about a king. A king is nothing without a kingdom, right? So the horn power is officially established in 538 A.D. and not before 538 A.D., but in 538 A.D. Up to that time, Arianism and Romanism, both claiming to be Christian, but both alike lacking many of the essentials of the religion of Christ, had been contending one against the other for supremacy. But the Goth, so far as being dominant was concerned, that hope perished in 538, and Romanism entered upon a new era in its career that led to a spiritual dominance unknown to the papal system before that time. It was in 533 AD that Justinian, the emperor, living in the east in Constantinople, addressed the pope as being, quote, head of all the churches in the Code of Justinian, uh, Library 1, Title 1. A little later, but in the same year, the emperor repeats a decision previously made that all affairs touching the church shall be referred to the pope, head of all bishops, and true and effective corrector of heretics. Ministry Magazine, C.B. Pullman, from 19, August 1931. Why the year 538? So is, is the papacy a horn power? Is he a king? Of course he is. Of course he is. From this point on, it seems as if the emperor living in the east, Justinian, who's some consider to be the la one of the last true Roman emperors, he hands off his authoritative power in 533 AD. To who? To the papacy. To do what? To be head of all the churches. That makes him a king, a leader, right? That all affairs touching the church shall be referred to the pope head of all bishops, and true and effective corrector of heretics. That's political power. Now he's able to deal with heretics as he sees fit. So you have a spiritual and political authority found in the Pope in 533 AD, according to the decree of Emperor Justinian. But the problem is, is that a horn can't be a horn without a city or a kingdom, can they? And that wasn't established until when? 538 AD. 538 AD. So the horn is restored. This is General Belisarius, who defeated the Ostrogoths in Rome in 538. That's Emperor Justinian there. And this is Pope Vigilius, who was the, the reigning pope at the time. It said, Vigilius, a pliant creature of Theodora, ascended the papal chair under the military protection of Belisarius. History of the Christian Church, volume 3, page 327. So in 538, when the Ostrogoths were moved out, the papal throne vacant was the papacy ascended to that throne under the protection of the political arm of Rome, making him, essentially crowning him as the king in Rome. Does that make sense? Because the emperor, where was he? Constantinople. From J.A. Wiley, on his book, The Papacy, at page 33 through 34, it says, The rank of Rome as the seat of government and the metropolis of the world had lifted her bishop to a proud preeminence above his peers. He's summarizing sort of what happened over the years. Okay? The papacy being the Bishop of Rome, at first all the bishops were basically on equal playing field. But Rome, being that it was the seat of the Roman Empire at one point, the bishop in Rome over, over years, over centuries, began to be elevated more and more by people like who they call Saint Augustine and other scholars and the people in general began to elevate. So whose fault is it? It's our fault. It's our fault that this happened. So, he had lifted her bishop to a proud preeminence above his peers, but Rome was the head of an empire no longer. 
the prestige of her name, in which all ages has struck the imagination so powerfully, and though the imagination captivated the judgment, she still retained, for by no charge could she become bereft of her immortal memories. But the subject nations no longer called her mother and ruler. With Rome would have fallen her bishop. You hear that? With Rome would have fallen her bishop. That's the papacy. Had he not, that's the papacy, had the papacy not, as if by anticipation of the crisis, reserved to this hour the masterstroke of his policy, he now boldly cast himself upon an element of much greater strength than of that of which the political convulsions of the times had deprived him, namely, that the bishop of Rome is the successor of Peter, the prince of the apostles, and in virtue of being so is Christ's vicar on earth. In making this claim, the Roman pontiffs vaulted at once over the throne of kings to the seat of gods. Rome became once more the mistress of the world and her popes the rulers of earth. Absolutely a horn power. You know what's interesting? We're, according to evolution, we're supposed to be getting smarter and smarter. Do you see the way these people write back then? This was written in the 1800s. Do you see the way some of, some of the quotes I read from Josephus and Tacitus went? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. But we're, we're smarter than them. <laughs> so that's, again, that's from J.A. Wiley, the papacy. Listen to this. From Thomas Hobbes. For from the time the Bishop of Rome had gotten to be acknowledged for Bishop Universal by pretense of succession to St. Peter, their whole hierarchy, or kingdom of darkness, may be compared not unfitly to the kingdom of fairies, that is, to the old wives' fables in England concerning ghosts and spirits, and the feats they play in the night. And if a man consider the original of this great ecclesiastical dominion, he will easily perceive that the papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire, sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. For so did the papacy start up on a sudden out of the ruins of that heathen power. Leviathan chapter 47. So as Rome declined, the empire of Rome, its leader essentially was found anew in the papacy. And as the political power declined, they claimed a spiritual authority to preserve themselves. They defeated Arianism, okay? And then they rose above the other political kings, the other horns, to the preeminence. As J.A. Wiley said, they vaulted, they like pole vaulted. They vaulted above the throne of kings to the throne of gods. And they became, once again, the rulers of the entire earth. Definitely a horn power. It reminds me of <clears throat> the occult teaching of the phoenix rising out of the ashes, which is a huge teaching in secret societies and in occult doctrine. This is seen in the papacy. And I'm sure it's a belief they hold themselves. So one, did it come from Rome? That's important. Islam, do they come from Rome? Well, it depends on who you talk to. But uh, <laughs> looking at it at base value, no. They come out of the Middle East, right? We'll take a look at that again later. The papacy, did they come out of Rome? Where are they located now? Rome. <laughs> They're still in Rome. Antiochus did not, but we're putting them both together. We're going to give, if, if Nero gets one, then Antiochus gets one, and vice versa, all right? Did they come from Rome? Nero did. Okay. Now, arises after the ten divisions of Rome. Hundreds of years before the ten divisions of Rome was Nero emperor. Hundreds of years. Antiochus? more hundreds of years. <laughs> An extra 200 years added on to that. Islam, did they arise out of the ten divisions of Rome? No. No. Actually, they arised 
after the papacy ascended the throne under Belisarius. It was in the 6th century, 7th century. But the papacy, they arise after the ten divisions of Rome. They arise out of Rome. Who plucks up three horns of Rome? Did Nero destroy three kings within his own empire? No, he did not. He was the only king, right? Because there was no divisions back then. Antiochus? Antiochus, he was like a remnant of a remnant. <laughs> you see, when Greece was first an empire under Alexander the Great, after Alexander fell, the kingdom divided, and the, the generals fought against each other, and eventually, as the fighting sort of simmered down, and peace was brought throughout the remnants of the Grecian Empire, there were four main sections. Four. So Antiochus, no. Islam, did they pluck up three horns of Rome? No. The papacy did. So, based on this alone, can Islam or Nero and Antiochus, can even, are, are they even allowed to continue to look at the characteristics? Because if you're the Antichrist, you have, to check, you have to check how many boxes? One of them? Two of them? Five of them? Or all of them? Every single one. But we're not going to do that. We're going to let them stay in the race. Because as we go further, like I said, I, I like things that are visual. So when we see this stacked up side by side, we'll, we'll see exactly what the information in the Bible is trying to tell us. Now, this is another important part. According to Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 14, which I'll read, the horn, the little horn power, is destroyed by God. Okay? Who is Antiochus IV Epiphanes destroyed by? The Jews, when they rose up against them, right? They gained their independence. How about Nero? Nero destroyed himself, didn't he? Islam, that's yet to be seen. I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousand, thousand, thousand ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body, body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So according to these verses, the Ancient of Days, God the Father, sitting in his throne, surrounded by angels, Christ comes to him, right? This says the Son of Man ascended to the Ancient of Days, came with the clouds of heaven. When did that happen? When Christ ascended, remember when he ascended and he ascended up in the clouds? And could you imagine being there? And they were probably like, uh, wait, what? Where's he going? <laughs> Isn't he going to restore the kingdom and all this stuff now? Remember they were asking him that? But the angels come. They say, why do you stare up into heaven? This same Jesus, he will come in like manner to you again. So Jesus goes to the ancient, there's a judgment that takes place here on the little horn power. And just because the fact that a judgment takes place before the close of time, we can know that this judgment has to deal with those who claim to be covered by the blood of Christ. Why do I say that? What takes place first, the judgment of the living or the wicked? Or the judgment of the righteous or the wicked? 
the judgment of the righteous, or those who so call themselves. Why? Why does that judgment take place first? The Apostle Paul says that we will judge angels, right? That will be in the second resurrection, not the first. So that'll take place when? After Christ returns, right? But there is a judgment that takes place before that, before Christ returns, because he doesn't choose all the saints and then bring them to heaven and then have a judgment with them and then say, see, I, all you guys were saved, this is why. That doesn't take place. The judgment's going on when Christ entered into the Day of Atonement in 1844. Everybody on earth who has ever claimed to be under God's grace and mercy and protection and their sins covered by the blood of the Lamb is written in the book of the Lamb. And they have to choose whether or not that person, when they come up in the judgment, was a legitimate Christian or was a deceiver. So just for the fact that this takes place before the second coming of Christ, it tells you that this power claims to be Christian. Does Nero claim to be Christian? Nope. Antiochus IV? No. Islam? No. <laughs> not even close. They do not. And who, is, who destroys it? God himself destroys it. So it's destroyed in the second coming by Christ. In other words, this power rules until Christ's second coming. Does that make sense? So do, is Nero still ruling today? No, he's not. Antiochus? No. They're long dead. Islam? They don't come from Rome. So, Rome rules because the beast rules, right? It's the beast, which is Rome, and its division of its horns and its little horn power. Rome rules until the judgment is declared and then Christ returns and destroys it himself. The only one that this could possibly fit in is the papacy because they're the ones who come from Rome. So what is this telling you about what's going on in the world? Who's actually in control of the world? Rome, according to the Bible. Rome. We're going to stop there and we'll pick it up in Daniel. As we keep going along, we'll see this chart grow more and more with these characteristics. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for its simplicity, Lord. Thank you that we can see the things clearly laid out in history. That we can know what your will is for our lives. That we can know of the prophecies of the, the Antichrist power whom you've warned us about. That we can know your truth. That we can be settled in it. That your faith is one faith. That your, your religion, your love, your, your kingdom... It extends beyond our cultural differences that we have here in this life. Lord, thank you so much for everything that you do for us on a daily basis. May we, may we know you more. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.